Romans chapter 8 is going to be the sermon text for today. First and foremost, praise God from whom all blessings flow. For this opportunity to be here today to preach the gospel, it's a blessing to see you all uh, here this morning. Today's sermon, I titled it The Trinitarian Gospel Part 2. Last week, I preached from Romans 8, verse 1 through 17, and today, by God's grace and Lord willing, I plan to preach from verse 18 through verse 30. So again, I want to set the stage for what my goal is today. In last week's sermon, I opened up by sharing several biblical texts on the triunity of God, and I also shared biblical texts about God's absolute sovereignty. And I feel it's appropriate that I do the same today as I, again, titled my sermon, The Trinitarian Gospel Part Two. Now, the reason why you wanna highlight key biblical texts, but also exposit them and explain what they mean is because, as you all know, Christ told us something in his word. Christ said that this is the judgment that light has come into the world, and but people loved the darkness rather than they loved the light because their deeds are evil. So many people today will profess to be Christians, yet just listen to what they profess to believe in. Look at their commitment and devotion to the, to the true gospel, and you'll learn that a lot of people are not so Christian after all. So the reason why I want to point out key biblical texts, because again, Look at what the culture does. The culture constantly tries to divorce Christ from the blessed and holy trinity. For example, if I go to a college campus and I go there to evangelize, to pass out gospel tracts, you know what the first thing they're going to say to me is? I'm typically asked by college students, where do you stand on homosexuality? And I say, well, I'm against it. The Bible's against it. And they typically will say, but Jesus never spoke out against it. And my response to that is pretty simple. I say, Jesus not only spoke out against it, he condemned it. You actually have to read the Old Testament in Genesis 19.24. In the Old Testament, the Bible literally says, now listen to this. It says, the Lord rained fire and brimstone upon Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of heaven. Did you see what I just did? The Lord is mentioned twice. So you have two distinct persons. Both are referred to as Lord, one in heaven and one on earth. This indicates Trinitarian plurality. So again, while many people try their absolute hardest to try to divorce the, the triunity of God, they will fail miserably. Because remember what God's word tells us in the Proverbs. Every word of God is true. He is a shield to those who put their faith and trust in him. Do not add to his word, lest he rebuke you and find you to be a liar. That's what Proverbs says. Additionally, Job taught us something in the Old Testament about the, about the triunity of God. And Job believed that God is absolutely sovereign. Job didn't question this. Job affirmed it. Listen to the language from Job in chapter 23. In Job 23, this is literally what we read. It literally says, he is of one mind. Who can change him? Whatever his soul desires, he does, and he performs that which is appointed for me. Additionally, read examples in Ecclesiastes 3.14. Ecclesiastes 3.14 says, Whatever the Lord does, we know that it is eternal. Nothing shall be added to it or anything, nothing should be taken away from it. God does it so men shall fear before him. Read Proverbs 16, 4. God made all things, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. Read Proverbs 16, verse 33. This text is beautiful because some people today, they put more allegiance into believing in chance than they do the sovereignty of God. You know somebody who denies the sovereignty of God who believes that they can flip a coin and wherever it lands is by chance. And I remind them, you should read Proverbs 16, 33. It literally says the lot falls into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. 
Think about your thoughts and your actions. Do you not real? Have you not read Proverbs 21, verse 1? It says, the king's heart is in the hands of God, like the rivers of water. He moves it whichever way he pleases. So, I argue with people, you want to spend a great deal of time learning about the sovereignty of God because we live in a world where everybody thinks too highly of themselves. Everybody thinks too highly, and if they read examples like Isaiah, I tell people, open up Isaiah and tell me what you come away with. What conclusions do you draw if you read examples like Isaiah 40, verse 17? Isaiah 40, 17 says that all the nations before him are as nothing and are counted as him as less than nothing and worthless. Additionally, other texts on God's absolute sovereignty, read Lamentations 3, 37 through 39. It says, and before I tell you this verse, the reason why I'm mentioning these sovereignty verses, because they're important. I actually, not kidding with you, I actually one time had a, a young man who actually has my same last name, no relation, sent me a message and said, do you believe that God ordained everything? And I said, of course I do, because he's God. It says he declared the end from the beginning. And I don't believe that end from the beginning means there's things excluded. He declared the end from the beginning. It's simple. He ordained it and it shall come to pass. Sometimes it's out of our reason why God does certain things, but he does it for a reason to carry out his purpose. Remember in Genesis, what certain people mean for bad, God means for good. I tell people these texts are important. But in my conversation with this young man, he actually said this to me. He said, so the fact that you're talking to me right now, you're freely deciding to talk to me. And I said, oh man, you really should read Lamentations 3. Lamentations 3, 37 through 39 literally says, who has uttered a word and it comes to pass unless it has been commanded by God? Is it not out of the mouth of the Most High that both good and bad come? And it says, how shall a, a living man complain about the punishment of his sins? Read Lamentations 3, 37 through 39. Another example, read uh, Daniel 4. Read Daniel chapter 4. It literally says that all the inhabitants of the earth are counted as nothing. It says he does according to his will among the armies of heaven, among the inhabitants of the world, and none can stay his hand or say to him, what hast thou done? So there's several texts in the Bible that describe God's sovereignty, but I want to get back to the triunity of God because one of the most troubling things today is a lot of people don't believe the Trinity is revealed in the Old Testament. There's a lot of professing Christians today that believe that the Trinity is only revealed in the New. And I challenge them, like, read. Go back and read. I can show you several examples in the Bible where there are plural prepositions, plural verbs, um, even plural adjectives. Where do you ever see plural adjectives? But you'll see it in Hebrew. And I could show you several examples in the Old Testament that show us Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I could show several examples. So a lot of people rely on the New Testament about the triadic formula in Matthew 28, most people know it as the baptismal formula. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Or a lot of people go to the apostolic benediction in 2 Corinthians, where it says, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. So a lot of people rely on the New Testament, but I argue, go to the Old Testament also. Go to the Old Testament. For example, why do we think in the New Testament Jesus calls himself the Son of Man? Why does he call himself that? A lot of people erroneously think son of man only refers to his humanity. No, son of man is referring to his absolute divinity as proof. Read Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, it's a text about the full divinity of Christ who shares glory with the Father, the ancient of days. For example, in Daniel chapter 7, in Daniel chapter 7, listen to what this prophet envisioned. 
It says, I was looking through the night visions, and I'm talking about Daniel 7, 13 through 14. He says, I was looking through the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him, and it was given to him a kingdom, a dominion, and a glory that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. And then it says that his dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall have no end, and his kingdom shall not pass away. Now, here's what's unique about Daniel chapter 7. Notice how there's two distinct persons. You have the Son of Man, and you have the Ancient of Days. Two distinct persons. And notice how it talks about shared glory. It shall be given to him a kingdom, a dominion, and a glory. Again, ladies and gentlemen, only God is to be worshipped. Worship to anyone else other than God is considered blasphemy in Scripture. Yet we see here the blessed Trinity. Because we know that the Father, Son, and the Spirit are three distinct and co-equal, co-glorious, and co-eternal persons. And these three persons share the same one undivided nature. So here's what's unique about that text in Daniel chapter 7 I just cited. Do you know that Jesus actually alludes to that in the New Testament? Remember Jesus when he went before the high priest? And the high priest said, tell us if you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Christ said, I am, and you will see me sitting at the right hand of power, coming with the clouds of heaven. So clearly Jesus told the high priest that he is fully God, but distinct from the Father, and he is that Son of Man who has shared glory with the Ancient of Days that was described in Daniel chapter 7. And you know what's unique about Daniel 7, coming with the clouds of heaven? That's reserved exclusively for God. You will never see anything in the Bible about a created being coming in the clouds of heaven. Coming with the clouds of heaven is reserved exclusively for God. So again, I wanted to share these texts with you for an introduction. Because again, today's sermon is going to be titled The Trinitarian Gospel, Part 2. And if you have your Bible turned open to Romans chapter 8, I'd like to begin at verse 18. I'd like to begin at verse 18, and I'm going to Read to verse 30. Would you please follow along with me? Romans 8, starting at verse 18, says, For I reckon that the sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not, what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose." For whom he did foreknew, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Last verse. Moreover, whom he did 
predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. So this is the reading of the Lord's Word. I'm going to ask you all to keep your Bible turned open. What I hope to accomplish today is to provide an expository commentary. And essentially what expository preaching is, is we just simply pick a section of Scripture and I just provide a commentary or an overview of each verse. So that way you walk away and you understand what the author intended for us to learn. Let's pray before I get into uh, the study of God's word. God Almighty, we behold these truths today in, in fear of the Lord, not a distrustful fear, but a biblical fear, knowing that God is absolutely sovereign. And Lord, we pray for thy Holy Spirit to give eyes to see, ears to hear, and uh, I pray, Lord, that you will carry out your purpose today in, in the preaching of this word as we know you will. We trust that you do all things in accordance with thy will and to the praise of thy glorious grace. It is in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Verse 18 is an important verse about suffering. Paul says, For I reckon that the suffering of the present time is not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed. And suffering for the sake of the gospel is certainly an important theme in the Bible. God's word tells us to expect it, believe it or not. And if you expect it, then you should not be too worried about the implications of it because of what the gospel promises are to God's people. In Mark 8, Jesus said, Whoever desires to follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will gain it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For surely I say to you, whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this wicked and perverse generation, I will also be ashamed when I come in the glory of my Father with my holy angels. That is what Christ said in the Gospel of Mark chapter 8. Now, for gospel believers, for people that will preach the truth to lost people, and again, I speak to them, whoever that may be watching or if it's you here today, if you genuinely preach the gospel and you're despised because of what you believe, be mindful they hated Christ first. You have to look at the gospel of John chapter 15. Jesus said, if the world hates you, Know that it hated me first, for if you were of the world, the world will love you of its own. Because you are not of the world, therefore the world hates you. So we know this to be true, right? This is absolutely true. Just, just walk outside and, and talk to people, and you'll learn very quickly who, who loves the truth and who doesn't. Additionally, we also have to remind ourselves what the Apostle Paul said in his letter to Timothy. He said, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So if you do preach the truth, you will suffer persecution. But I argue you should rejoice over this. It's in the Acts, I believe the fifth chapter, when we read that, that God's ministers, they left the councils and they rejoiced and they counted it worthy to suffer the shame for the sake of Christ. Paul is a, is a great ambassador to talk about suffering. For Paul to say something about suffering, I tend to be very attentive to what he says because of the fact that he endured a lot of persecution. Paul was somebody who practiced what he preached. Paul was a person that endured because of the gospel he professed. For example, if you read First and Second Corinthians. Here's what you're going to learn about Paul's sufferings. In First Corinthians 4, for example, Paul said, we are fools for Christ's sake. Paul said, you are wise and we are weak. You are strong and honorable and we are despised. Paul said in First Corinthians 4, he said that we are hungry and thirsty. Paul said, 
that we are naked, we are buffeted, we are homeless. Paul even said in 1 Corinthians 4 that he is regarded as the scum of the earth, the refuse of all things. You got to read 2 Corinthians 11. Look at the sufferings Paul endured in that chapter. In 2 Corinthians 11, Paul even said that multiple times he received 40 lashes. Multiple times he was shipwrecked. Multiple times he was beaten with a rod and was even once pelted with stones. This man says he endured daily struggles. Again, he legitimately knew what suffering was. Yet, the Bible tells us to rejoice over these things, not to fret. The Bible tells us not to fret over these things. For example, in, in 1 Peter 4.13, 1 Peter 4.13 says, Rejoice, for you have been partakers of the suffering of Christ. And when his glory shall be revealed, it says, you shall be glad with exceeding joy. Yes. And that's why Paul said in Romans 8, verse 18, for I reckon that the sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed. Good example of that. Read Stephen in the Bible. Remember Stephen after he rebuked those wicked men and, and told them that they were uncircumcised in heart and they were stiff-necked? The Bible says that these men rushed him. They says they gnashed their teeth at him and they dropped him to the ground and they stoned him. And in that process, he gazed up into heaven, saw the glory of God and saw Jesus at the right hand of the Father. So that's why the Bible says things like, the sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed. So God's people know that when they draw their last breath, and I'm talking about God's people who believe the true gospel. I'm not talking about people that just profess Christianity by name, but legitimate born again believers who profess the true gospel. They know that when they draw their last breath, that they will stand in the presence of Christ because didn't the Savior say, today you will be with me today in paradise. That's why, look at verse 19. Look what verse 19 says. It says, for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. This verse right here in verse 19 is very similar in my opinion to 1 John 3, 2. If you read 1 John 3, 2, it literally says now that we are sons of God, it says when he shall appear, we shall be like him and we shall see him as he is. So for application for these two verses, and I speak to those who are legitimately being persecuted because of their faith. Just remember this. Persecution is expected. Know that Christ said that if they hate you, they hated him first. Preach the truth with love. Don't be arrogant. It's hard. And, know, and if you do, just repent by God's grace. If God gives you that gift, make sure that you are patient with people. Don't compromise. And make sure that when you are preaching to people that you testify about the contents of the gospel, the true gospel, unashamedly and promiscuously to all men that you meet. And I tell people, and if you are persecuted, it's how you handle it. That's important. There are some people today, if you look at Paul's example of suffering, Paul believed in the sovereignty of God, so he, he always went to, to God for comfort. If you are legitimately suffering for the sake of Christ, go most importantly to God, but also you want to make sure that you, you contact your brother in private. Go to them for comfort and consolation. You want to be careful today because the, the the whole context of social media today, a lot of people... Sometimes you have to challenge the veracity of their claims of persecution because a lot of people are looking for self-aggrandizement. 
They're looking for self-promotion. Oh, I'm persecuted. Let me take a selfie and, and let everybody know. It's like, there you go. You have your reward. What do you, what's the purpose if you're being persecuted? You're, if you legitimately are persecuted, you take it to the Lord. You don't take it to the court of public opinion and social media. So, again, this is just a few quick biblical points on how to deal with legitimate persecution. Look at the next two verses with me, please. Paul goes on to say in verse 20 and 21, Paul says, For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. In verse 20, notice how he talks about the creature was subject to vanity. Now, this word vanity is actually referring to the depravity or the moral corruption that exists in all men when they're born into this world because of Adam's sin in the garden that was imputed to all of his posterity. That's what it was referring to. And in fact, if you look at that word, word vanity, it's used a couple times in the Bible. And what you want to do is when you see a word mentioned in Scripture, examine where else it's used. I promise you this, if you go to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 18, you're going to see that word vanity in there also. 2 Peter 2.18 literally says that they speaketh great words of vanity. And it says they allure through the lust of the flesh. And then after it mentions the lust of the flesh, then it also mentions uh, another, another mention of, of depravity, of wantonness, I think it mentions. But you also have to remember, look what also verse 20 says. It says, for the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly. The mention of not willingly there is important because remember what the Bible tells us. God declared the end from the beginning. So God ordained the creation to be subject to vanity, but guess what else he did? God also ordained for his elect to be delivered from this eschatological um, vanity. So again, this is important here. Take a look at the text with me again in verse 21. It says, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. When I read verse 21, I'm reminded of, I believe it is in 2 Peter 3.13 where it says that we, according to his promises, look forward to the new heavens and the new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Let's look at the next few verses. Let's now read verse 22 through 25. Romans 8, 22 says, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And... Not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Now, let's start with verse 22. Notice in verse 22, he talks about groaneth and travaileth. Now, this is important terminology here. The creation that groaneth and travaileth. Interestingly, Paul uses this imagery. It's nothing new. In fact, if you look at 1 Thessalonians 5, remember how it talks about the coming of the Lord will come upon men like a thief in the night. And then it uses the imagery about labor pains. How it says that people think peace and safety and all of a sudden it will come upon you like the way labor pains comes upon a woman. And that's essentially what he's saying. Here. The whole creation groaneth and travaileth. He uses the imagery of labor pains. 
And the reason why the creation groaneth and travaileth is because of Adam's sin. That's exactly why the creation groaneth and travaileth. But notice how the text says, but until now. Now, the reason why the mention of until now, and that's because of the gospel of Christ. Remember something. The creation groaneth and travaileth because of Adam, but Christ accomplished what Adam could not. And it's because of his perfect righteousness, which is why the book of Revelation chapter 21 says, God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be no more death, sorrow, crying, pain, or suffering for the former things have passed. So that's the beauty of the gospel promises. That's why he says, until now. That's in verse 21. Now look at what he says in, in verse 23. That was 22 I mentioned a minute ago. Now we're gonna to go to verse 23. And it says, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. Now let's talk about the first fruits of the spirit, because a lot of people don't know what this means, the first fruits of the spirit. And I'll explain it in an easy way. Basically, I was reading a, a notable theologian by the name of Mounts. And while I don't agree with everything this guy teaches, he made a good point about first fruits of the Spirit. He says that in the Old Testament, it refers to the initial portion of the harvest that was given as a sacrifice to God. But he says Paul uses it as an eschatological pledge or to refer to the fruits of the Spirit. Now, the reason why I agree with this because of the mention of the Holy Spirit in this verse. When you're reading verse 23, it's very similar to when you're examining texts like Ephesians 1, 13 through 14. If I read Ephesians 1, 13 through 14, remember what the Bible tells us. It says that you have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. It says, which you believed and you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And then it says, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. So again, this is gospel promises that God gives to his people. Why do we think verse 24 and 25 mentions hope? In verse 24 and 25, the Bible mentions hope. Hope, and this refers to the hope of the gospel and the gospel promises. The reason why I know this refers to the hope of eternal life or the gospel promises, because all you just have to do is cross-reference. For example, if I read Colossians 1 regarding hope, doesn't Colossians 1 tell us that hope is laid up for God's elect in heaven? Doesn't Titus 1 tell us that the hope of eternal life was promised to God's elect in eternity by God? Doesn't Titus 3 tell us that, that we are heirs of the hope of eternal life? That's what the Bible promises to us about the hope of eternal life. That is the point of verse 24 and through 25. And guess who gives us this hope? the Holy Spirit. And the reason why I know that is because if you look at Romans 15, guess what the apostle said about the Holy Spirit? The apostle said that may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Again, so that's the blessing of the promises of eternal life or the hope of of eternal life. Remember, it is laid up for us in heaven, for God's elect. It is promised by God in eternity to his particular people. And the Bible says that we are heirs of the hope of eternal life. God's word is explicit about this. Now, speaking about the Holy Spirit, this actually is a good transition into the next two verses that I can now address the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 26 and 27 with me, please. 
Romans 8, 26 to 27 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Let's pause here for a moment so I can provide commentary about the Holy Spirit. Now, if you guys want to hear a full sermon, I actually in the past preached a full hour-long sermon on the doctrine and the person of the Holy Spirit. So you can just go to YouTube and, and watch that there. But regarding 26 through 27, let me share with you some important information about the doctrine and the person of the Holy Spirit. Now, first of all, I can tell you this. The Holy Spirit is in every way God, but distinct from the Father and the Son. The reason why we know that, or you can know that, is just by looking at the Bible and seeing how the Bible says things about the Holy Spirit that can only be said about God. For example... Doesn't the Bible teach us that the Holy Spirit is an agent of creation? For example, if you look at Genesis 1, doesn't the Bible say, the Spirit hovers over the face of the water? That's the first one. Doesn't the Bible tell us that the Holy Spirit regenerates the heart? Only God can regenerate the hearts, but that's the point. The Holy Spirit is in every way God, but distinct from the Father and the Son. And let me give you the reference. Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36 says, And I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. And I will take out your stony heart, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you. Look at Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3 says, Not by the works done by us in righteousness, but according to his mercy, he saved us, the washing of regeneration, the renewal of the Holy Ghost. Read Titus 3. So the Holy Spirit is in every way God, but distinct from the Father and the Son. And here's another important point. When you read texts like Romans 8, 26 through 27, the Holy Spirit is a person. There are people today that don't believe the Holy Spirit is a person. They're going to say, how can a ghost or a spirit be a person? Well, it's very simple because that's what the Bible teaches and I'll show you guys some good exegetical points you need to remember. Listen to this exegetically. This is where you have to use grammar. In John 14, 16, Jesus says, and I will pray to the Father, and he will send you a helper, and he will abide with you forever. Now, when Jesus says, and I will pray to the Father, what is I? That's first person. And notice he says he twice. He will send you a helper and he will abide with you forever. What person is he? He is the third person. So we know the Holy Spirit is a person because Jesus speaks in the first person about the Father and the Holy Spirit in the third person. If you ever run into a cult member and someone who says, well, I don't believe the Holy Spirit is a person, just ask them to read Acts 13, 2. And the very words that come out of our mouth refute themselves. For example, Acts 13, 2 literally says, the Holy Ghost said, separate for me, Barnabas and Saul for the work I have given unto them. So tell the cult member, notice what you just said. You just said me and I. If the Holy Spirit isn't a person, then why does the Spirit say me and I? Why does the Spirit speak in the first person? Separate me, Barnabas and Saul for the work I have given unto them. So again, the moment the cult member says the Bible out loud, he refutes himself. Because he says the Holy Spirit is not a person, but that he quotes the Bible and he refers to the Spirit in the first person. See how easy it is to refute people that don't understand the truth? Additionally, regarding the Holy Spirit, notice the context of Verse 26 and 27, how the Spirit helps us in our infirmities. The Spirit prays for us because we do not know how to pray as we ought. That's because the Bible refers to the Holy Spirit as the Comforter. 
as the helper. And guess what the comforter and the helper does according to the Gospel of John? Specifically, you want to read John 16 and you want to read John 14. This is where you're going to see a lot about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And guess what the Bible tells us about the ministry of the Holy Spirit? The Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. The Spirit will abide with you forever. The Spirit will teach you all things. The Spirit will bring to remembrance all things I have said to you. That's important that you remember that. Because, again, the Holy Spirit is in every way God, but distinct from the Father and the Son. So you need to know about the Holy Spirit. And notice in the context in Romans 8, 26 through 27, how God's word says, the spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, of course, no one can possibly fathom those groanings quite simply because they cannot be uttered. So there are certain things beyond our comprehension according to scripture. And according to the text that I have read to you, that the, only the Spirit searches the hearts. Now, that's important. That's important because remember the text I read to you earlier. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, the Bible says, God sees not as man sees. Man looks at the outward, but God looks at the heart. So it's important that you always remember that. And notice in the text in 26 through 27, the Spirit makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Sadly, today I tell people, regarding prayer, you need to read this. Some people today think that their prayers can change God. And I argue that's, that's I would argue that a person that believes that is misguided if they say such thing. And the reason why I argue they're misguided because, first of all, prayers can't change God because God ordained everything. Number two, God doesn't change. God is immutable. Read Malachi. The Bible says, I, the Lord, I do not change. Read the author of Hebrews. It says Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if you read the Bible carefully in the New Testament, you'll see that prayer is in accordance to the will of God. Exactly what the Bible says here in verse 27. Why do we think God's word says, Thy will be done. Let's move on to verse 28. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. So let's pause here for a moment. I want to address this text by itself because you're looking at one of the most twisted texts Meaning, this is the text that many lost people will twist to their own destruction. So let me provide commentary on this and tell you how people will try to twist it. There are some people today who think that, well, good things are going to happen in my life if I love God. Well, let me tell you why that argument is erroneous. First of all, the reprobate don't love God. They hate him. Read Proverbs 8, 36. Proverbs 8, 36. Proverbs 8, verse 36 says, All they that hate me love death. So the non-elect do not love God. Secondly, the Bible is very clear that God's people know they don't love God first. God loved them first. So you can't say that we know good things are going to happen to us if we love God because 1 John 4.10 says, not that we loved him, but he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Third, since I've already explained how the, the non-elect don't love God, and even God's particular people know that they don't love him first, God loves them first, and then they love God, I always tell people you got to always go to Romans 9 also because Romans 9 says, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Many people fail also to realize the last part of verse 28. They love to mention the verse, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, but they forget that last part. 
those who are called according to his eternal purpose. They for, tend to forget that last part, either intentionally or, or the inadvertently. But some people today think when they read that part, to those who are called according to his eternal purpose, the unregenerate believe that God calls all men. They do. They believe that God calls all men. Well, hold on a minute. If you believe God calls all men, why is that not the case in Matthew 22? Matthew 22 says, many are called, few are chosen. It doesn't say all men are called, does it? Many are called, few are chosen. So the mention of called that's used, I argue that it's referring to the, 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 the calling from God to be a Christian. For example, if you look at 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1, I believe it's 2 Timothy 1 verse 9 where it says, He saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his purpose and grace which he gave us in Christ before the world began. So that is how you want to examine Romans 8 verse 28. And our last two verses, the, probably the crux of today's sermon, 29 through, through 30, two of probably the most notable texts in the whole Bible. They call this the golden chain of redemption. Please look at Romans 8, verse 29 through 30. Romans 8, 29 through 30. Romans 8, starting at verse 29, says, For whom he did foreknew, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. These are our last two verses today, but let me start first in 29. I need to provide exegesis over this because if you were to show this Bible verse to an Arminian, they look at the word foreknow, which is a verb. And they're going to take that verb foreknow, and this is how they're going to interpret verse 29. They're going to say that in eternity, or before the creation of the world, the Arminian is going to say that God foresaw who would believe in him, and then God chose them to be saved. Again, it's because he saw in eternity that they would believe in him. That is how Arminians are going to abuse this verb. Now, I argue holding to that view elevates the will of man above the will of God. That view makes men's decisions more superior than the master's decree. I've said that many times and in many sermons. Here's how you refute that. Now, you have to pay careful attention to detail to the exegesis I provide. Let's just stick real quick with that verb. If you examine that verb forno, in the Greek, it's the word proegno. The inflected word is the word proginosko. Now, regarding this word, it's used five times in the Bible. It's used in Acts 26, 5. It's used in Romans 8, 29. It's used in Romans 11, 2. It's also used in 1 Peter and 2 Peter. Okay, but primarily in today's sermon, I want to focus on the text only where God is the subject of the verb. That's all I'm going to focus on today is where God is the subject of the verb. Now, we know God is the subject of the verb in Romans 8, 29, those whom he foreknows. So clearly God is the subject of the verb. Romans eleven two, 2, God is the subject of the verb. Romans eleven two 2 says... God will not cast away his people whom he foreknew. And then also in 1 Peter 1.20, it says, who is foreordained before the creation of the world. So let me talk about these three verses real quickly here. When you look at Romans 8.29, when you look at Romans 11.2 and 1 Peter 1.20, where the same verb is used, foreknow, you'll see that it's synonymous with forelove and foreordain. So where God is the subject of the verb, foreknow, it is used interchangeably with forelove and foreordain. Let's establish that immediately. 
Now what you want to do is when you're examining these three verses, as I said before, you know God is the subject of the verb. Now here's where I want to challenge you guys. What is the object of the verb? This is how you determine how to interpret the word for now. For example, in Romans 8.29, Romans 8.29 says, for whom he did foreknow. So again, I argue, what is the object of the verb foreknow? Well, it's in the verse previously. To those who are called according to his purpose. So the object of the verb is pointing to men, the called ones. It's not pointing to their decisions to believe. So that rules out the whole Arminian view of for no, how they interpret this verb. Now go to Romans 11 too, because again, the same verb is used for no in verse 29 of Romans 8 is also used in Romans 11 too. It says, God will not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Now what's the object of the verb foreknew or foreno? It's people. It, the object of the verb is not men's decisions to believe or men's actions. It's referring to people. If you go to 1 Peter 1.20, 1 Peter 1.20 says, it says, who was foreordained before the creation of the world. Again, that's the same inflected word, prognosco, that's used here in Romans 8.29 for foreknow. So again, if you read 1 Peter 1.20, you have to ask yourself, what is the object of the verb foreordained? It's not referring to decisions, it's not referring to actions. It's referring to Christ. Okay? So that's why I tell people the, the Arminian view that God foresaw who would believe in him and then God had to choose them on that basis. They can't prove that grammatically because, again, the subject of the three verbs I showed you guys is God. And the object of the verb points to men, points to people, not their decisions. So that is how you refute the Arminian heresy, commonly known as the prescience view, or they typically call it conditional election. Now I want to get into the key text for today's sermon, is 29 and 30. Now, most people today know 29 and 30 as what's called the golden chain of redemption. You got five verbs that are mentioned. You have foreknow predestined, called, justified, and glorified. These are all active verbs. Now, of course, Arminians are not the only ones that are going to misinterpret some of these verbs. You're also going to find that there's a lot of Reformed and Sovereign Grace believers that will as well. For example, Romans 8 and 29 through 30 is a, is a debated text among even Sovereign Grace believers and a lot of Reformed people, and I'll tell you how. It's regarding what's called the timing of justification. Now, if you don't know what is involved in this debate, when I say the timing of justification, in other words, the question, when are the elect declared righteous before God? Some people today will argue the elect were declared righteous in eternity, and they're gonna go to this text, Romans 8, 20, 90, 30. Others are gonna say, the elect were declared righteous at the cross, and they're going to probably cite Romans 5. And others are going to say the elect are declared righteous in time when the Holy Spirit applies Christ to them. Now, if you listen to people, they, I can tell you right now, a lot of people have never exegeted this text properly. I'm just going to be forthright with you guys. A lot of people will typically go to what this pastor said, a lot of people will go to the creeds and the confessions. The creeds and the, the confession, Westminster uh, Confession and also the London Baptist Confession, the Baptist version of it, they both say the elect are justified in time. But I argue, who cares what the confession says and who cares what men say? Go to the Bible. The Bible is your ultimate rule of faith and practice. What does the Bible say? Now, here's why I argue that Romans 8, 29 through 30 doesn't teach that the elect are justified in eternity. I argue that it's, it's not a good example to use for justification in eternity. And I'll tell you why. First of all, let me start first with the first two verbs that are mentioned. This is critical. 
the first two verbs that are mentioned are foreknew and predestined. Now, let me break them down a little bit for you. Both of these verbs start with the prefix in Greek, pro. So, for example, in Greek, the word foreknew is the word proegno. Notice the word pro, the prefix. That prefix is critical because it means before. So, proegno, before new, foreknew. Then you look at the word predestined, pro orise. Pro is the word before, orise is determined. So you have before new and before determined. So the context is referring to the decree of God. It's referring to election. That's the context of Romans 8, 29 through 30, what God ordained. The moment you take Romans 8, 29 through 30 and start arguing it, it's proof that God declared the elect righteous in eternity, you're now conflating justification and election. They're not the same doctrine, ladies and gentlemen. Don't conflate these two. Election is active and unconditional. Justification is by grace alone, through faith alone, because of the righteousness of Christ alone. So they're two different doctrines. So another thing you have to be careful for because again, the, the two verbs that start the golden chain clearly deal with the decree because it's dealing with foreknew and predestined. So you're gonna have to distinguish, and I'll define my terms here. You have to distinguish between what's called the transient act and the imminent act. Imminent act deals with what God ordained. The transient act refers to when it actually takes place. For example, and I want to make sure you guys understand what I'm trying to say. I can say that in eternity, in the imminent act of God, that he ordained for us to be here right now. You know how I know? Because God is eternal, therefore his decree is eternal. Everything has been decided in eternity. There's no question about that. But today didn't take place in eternity. It's taking place right now, 2023, in this month, at this very second. So there's a distinguishing feature between imminent act and the transient act. Romans 8, 29 through 30 is dealing with the imminent act of God. In other words, it reveals that God ordained the justification and the glorification of the elect in eternity, but it does not mean that God declared the elect justified in eternity because the golden chain does not start with justified. Called comes before justified, but the golden chain starts with the decree because it mentions foreknew and predestined. So let me tell you how advocates of eternal justification are trying to, they are going to try to make arguments to support their views, but it's of no avail. Let me give you a prime example. And I want to interact with another pastor. There is a pastor by the name of Don Fortner. He's since passed away. He's a sovereign grace minister. He believed in justification in eternity. Now, let me give a disclaimer. I met this man before, very kind, and I can say it was an honor to meet him. So my arguments against his theology are not a personal attack. It is a theological argument against his views. But Fortner would argue, well, look at the verbs. They're all in the aorist tense. And Fortner argued, take a look at every one of the verbs. He said, if you take a look at foreknew, predestined, called, justified, and glorified, and he argued because they're in the aorist tense, that means past tense, so that means God justified the elect in eternity. Well, with all due respect to Pastor Fortner, he didn't understand the very basic, rudimentary level of Greek grammar. He didn't. And ladies and gentlemen, this is why... I love homeschooling and because I'll tell you right now, man, that in homeschooling, children are taught grammar. Grammar is critical in understanding the Bible. If you're legitimately taught grammar properly, it will help you as you interpret the Bible because a basic rudimentary knowledge of Greek, anyone will tell you in seminary in their very first class that, that the aorist Tense doesn't always mean past tense. There's all kinds of errors in the Bible grammatically. You know the type of errors you have? 
You have a dramatic aorist. You have an epistolary aorist. You have a futuristic aorist. You have an aggressive aorist. You have a punctiliar aorist. You have a timeless aorist. You also have aorists that can be interpreted in the present tense. So when pastors make comments like, what's in the aorist tense? That means God declared the elect justified in eternity. That is just sloppy. And I say that respectfully. Again, my arguments are a theological argument against Pastor Fortner, not a personal attack. I just radically disagree with his interpretation of Romans 8, 29 through 30. Now, here's another thing. Pastors that make the argument, well, they're in the aorist tense, so it happened in the past. Well, take a look at glorified. Glorified is an aorist. Are we going to say that we're all glorified saints right now? Of course not. That would be a silly interpretation. Glorified, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you the type of aorist that glorified is. And again, I'm going to say it's kind of a big word, but I always try to provide definitions for what I mean. Glorified is what's called a futuristic or a proleptic aorist. Do you know what that means? A proleptic aorist, according to the Greek grammar beyond the basics, a proleptic aorist basically describes an event that has not yet taken place as if it has already been completed. So again, it's describing something that hasn't taken place as if it has already been completed. So basically, what Paul is arguing, and this is the basically the underlying theme in the context of Romans 8, 29 through 30, that God ordained the justification of the elect in eternity. So it is as good as done because God's inviolable plan of election can never be thwarted. That's the point that Paul was trying to make in Romans 8, 29 through 30. It's not dealing with justification in eternity. Now here's another argument that eternal justification advocates are gonna make. They're gonna say, that called, because it comes before justified, they're gonna to try to strip it of its efficacy. Because remember, if they argue that we're justified in eternity, well, they have a problem because called comes before justified. So you have to be effectually called and then justified. So again, that poses a major problem for eternal justification advocates. So here's what they have to do. And Pastor Fortner did this in his interpretation of Romans 8.30. Fortner argued that called, the inflected word kaleo that's used in Romans 8.30, he argued it was not irresistible and it was not efficacious. Well, of course he has to take that position because the moment that he were to concede the actual interpretation for called being effectual and irresistible, that undermines his view of justification in eternity because called comes before justified. But let me tell you how his argument can easily be refuted, contextually and grammatically. Now, contextually, let's just look at the context. Notice when you're reading it, we know that those whom he foreknew will inevitably be glorified. Do you read the golden chain and do you ever walk away thinking, hmm, God predestined some and while some may be called, I don't think they all will be justified and glorified. In other words, could you imagine if someone says that God predestined the elect to be saved but not all of the elect will be saved because called is not irresistible or efficacious? That would of course be absurd. But the context of Romans 8, 29 through 30 starts with forno, goes to predestined, just called, justified, and glorified. So the immediate context in and of itself proves that every single verb in this golden chain is irresistible, they're efficacious, they are eternal because God ordained it, and every single one of these verbs are immutable. Now let's talk about exegetically. Why do we think it's called the golden chain of redemption? Don't you have links that connect a chain together? 
That's what you have here when you look grammatically. There's a demonstrative pronoun that Paul used. If you don't know what a demonstrative pronoun is, it's pointing back to something. It's the word them. A demonstrative pronoun is the word them. Notice how it says, whom he predestined, them he called. Whom he called, them he justified. Whom he justified, them he glorified. That demonstrative pronoun, according to a scholar named Mu, basically shows that it is precisely those whom he predestined, he called. It is precisely those who he called that will be justified. It is precisely those he justified that will be glorified. So again, here's how we know that every single one of these verbs are eternal, meaning God ordained it. Again, because of the fact you can't say that God foreknew the elect and not all of the elect will inevitably be glorified. Again, if God ordained it, it will come to pass. Secondly, we know the verbs here are discriminative. We know God's golden chain of redemption is clearly discriminative and it's irresistible. Because of that demonstrative pronoun, them, it is precisely those that are called them he justified. That's why he uses that demonstrative pronoun because it links it together. Additionally, when I was reading Fortner's exegesis of the word called, he tried to argue it's not efficacious and it's not irresistible. And he would go to that inflected word kaleo that's used in Romans 8.30. And he tried to argue that it doesn't have a salvific meaning and it doesn't have a irresistible or effectual meaning. And that right there can easily be refuted. That same inflected word in verse 30, the word kaleo, the inflected word, is also used in Galatians 1.15. Paul says that God who, who called me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. The word called is used. That's the same inflected word kaleo. And he says by his grace. Guess whose grace that's referring to? It's referring to God's grace. Ladies and gentlemen, any Calvinist, any so-called sovereign grace believer worth his salt knows that God's grace is irresistible and it's efficacious. And it's that same verb, inflected verb, kaleo, in Galatians 1.15, called by his grace, is also used in Romans 8.30 when it says called and then justified. So again, refuting the eternal justification views are easy in my opinion. Now what's the next verb that is mentioned? Justified. Justified is mentioned here. Now a couple points I wanna mention about justification. Justification does not mean that God's particular people are subjectively changed, no. It means they are legally and forensically declared to be righteous because of the finished work of Christ alone. Righteousness or justification is not infused. It is imputed. And anytime you speak about the doctrine of justification and you're addressing the ground and assurance of our justification, you always have to emphasize Christ's active and passive obedience meaning his vicarious law-keeping and his substitutionary death that is credited to God's particular people because of what Christ accomplished on their behalf. Now, of course, justified is also an aorist. And some people argue, well, the fact that justified is an aorist, it's past tense, means it happened in eternity. Again, another sloppy argument that can easily be refuted. Let me tell you how. This is an easy way how to refute them. And again, it's the grammar. I tell people this is why grammar is so important. If God, hypothetically speaking, if God justified the elect in eternity and at the cross, remember what those two views teach. Men who believe in justification in eternity and justification at the cross believe it either happened in one of those two times and it doesn't happen in the future. So if that's the case, anytime you see the verb justified in the Bible, you would only expect to see past tense. But that's not the case. It's not the case. People have not done their homework, ladies and gentlemen. They get an F for bad grammar, and I'll tell you why. 
Because if you go to Romans 3.24, remember how the Bible says being justified freely by his grace. Do you know that verb there? It's the Greek verb, the keumeni. Being justified. Now look at the end of it. Meni, meni, the keumeni. That verb right there that's used is in the present tense. Guess what else Paul said in Romans 3 verse 30? Remember he says, shall justify? That's not past tense. That's future tense. That's the Greek word, the keosi. So in Romans 3.24, you have the Greek verb, the keomeni, being justified. And in Romans 3.30, it says, shall justify, the keosi, and that's future tense. So you know what this means, right? This means that God justified the elect in the past, but he continues to justify the elect in the present, and he will continue to justify the elect in the future. You see how the exegesis speaks for itself. God's word literally defends itself. So again, the people today that argue, oh no, God doesn't justify anybody today in the present or in the future because it either happened in eternity or at the cross. That's easily refutable. Let's go to the grammar. And again, remember that last verb, glorified. Glorified, that's mentioned. It's a proleptic aorist. Remember that definition I provided to you all. A proleptic aorist, again, according to the Greek grammar beyond the basics, it describes an event that has not taken place as if it has already been completed. So according to Paul, since God ordained the justification of the elect in eternity, it is as good as done, even though it has not yet taken place, because God's inviolable plan of election can never be thwarted. Remember what the Old Testament says. None can stay his hand or say to him, what hast thou done? This concludes the sermon. I pray next week you will join me as I hope to complete the whole chapter of Romans chapter 8. So again, we've covered from Romans 8, verse 1, all the way to verse 30. Next week, by God's grace, I plan to preach starting at verse 31 to the very end of the chapter which ends in nothing will separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the gospel of grace. Thank you, Lord, that you have ordained the justification and the glorification of, of your particular people. We rejoice in this truth and, and our assurance of salvation rests only in, in what Christ accomplished on our behalf. We thank you, Lord, for um, the blessings of, of gospel fellowship and for thy word because thy word is truth. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.